that's cool. Saw two deer in the headlights this morning. Big cat on my trail camera, right where all the elk were a couple days ago, so I guess he probably ran him off from that zone. I'll switch over to the other camera. I can't use this camera today because I've only got my uh, monster lens on it. That's why you can only hear my annoying voice right now. <laughs> Switch over. Well, I was thinking about trying to pull off an hour's worth of sharing emails from here, but it is pretty shitty out. And that's where I was running around all morning on the side of that hill, dead center. And all down in there trying to get my eyes on those elusive elk. So tough. So tough to get your eyes on them. I was hoping to videotape them over there. No. Makes it even tougher sometimes, you know, you come out and you want to look. Your senses are on fire. The second I get out of the vehicle this morning, I don't know where, but I heard Something. Thought I heard something once hitting a tree or something. Good bang. Way in the distance. And, uh, and then I heard a second time without a doubt when I was walking. It was quite a ways away, but still, it sure messes with your concentration on what you've came to do. Well, that it is what it is, I guess. It's part of our lifetime. Pretty gnarly, pretty gnarly country here, isn't it? Pretty gnarly. It's so hard, it's so hard to get my eyes on that herd of elk that's in here. I just want to find one of those two monster bulls and get and get a real cool video of them in this timber down there somewhere. It's pretty tough. It's a jungle down there. It's crazy. It's so thick. They're all over the place on those trails. I suspected a few days ago, and then uh, I went this morning, and the only thing on the camera was a big cat. I'm like, okay, I guess that's why they're not hanging on that trail right now. I was over there. Oh, where am I? It's right across the valley behind me here. And off to the left a little more in the dark at first light. And then uh, in a bit of a confluence of one, two, two big valleys, I guess. It's kind of a three-way intersection of valleys, a T section in a way. So there's all these mountains here facing that way, those mountains facing this way, those mountains facing that way. This is in the bottom, my first light this morning. And uh, I'm really jacked up to come out here and do what I'm doing. But then I went up that valley first to let out some bugles, see if maybe I could get an answer and locate those elk. And I felt really anxious getting away from the vehicle in the dark up there. I don't know why. It's like, oh no, I'm not into this feeling, you know? I'm here to have fun and try to find these elk. And then uh, I drove back down the main road there and then parked at the bottom of the old deactivated road. I was going to walk up and you know, you walked along, you got gravel under your boots and stuff. And it was drizzling rain and then, uh, and then I thought I heard a, thought I heard that sound, you know, that annoying sound of wood on wood. I'm like, oh, no, I'm not into this. It kind of sucks in a way, 
you can't stop yourself, and all you people out there that know, you know what I'm talking about. You can't stop yourself from really paying attention from that point on, right? It's like, uh oh, did I just hear that? And then you're not fully focused on the fun activity that you came all the way out here to do. And uh, then I walked another 10 minutes, and then bam, then I heard it for sure. And it was a ways away, like quite a ways away, across the valley for sure. Well, I can't say that for sure. It could have been way up the mountain above me, below me, wherever it was, that echo, that sound boomed right here. And then that was it for my concentration, right? So now you are split concentrating on what you're doing, what you want to do, and then you cannot stop yourself from being over, over aware of absolutely everything. Because you try not to be, because you want to relax and have fun, right? funny when I find myself daydreaming a lot when you're by yourself you need a lot of time to think to yourself. I remember one friend of mine saying, just came out and said to me, you know, I don't believe in these things. And you know what I said to him flat out, I go, you're lucky. I wish I didn't. Like sometimes, a lot of times, I really truly wish I didn't. I wish I didn't know. And you wouldn't have to have this annoying over awareness, this annoying, almost what maybe you could describe as anxiety, I don't know, when you're trying to continue to be out here and enjoy yourself. And those are the times that it kind of sucks that when you think about your friends that scoff and laugh at this topic and they, uh, they don't want to accept it, they don't have to, that's fine. And, and, uh, and I honestly sometimes I'm I find myself envious of that, <laughs> right? Anyway, maybe I'll get back to the shop. And uh, get some emails heard from there. I'm in between rain blasts. There's another one coming. Tough to escape the wind here, but anyway, thought I'd show you guys some country and share some thoughts. So, there you go. Maybe I'll swing the camera and show you where I was running around this morning. I was across over there. You see there's a line of trees in the bottom running diagonal the very across the lower third of the screen and that's actually a creek. That's down in that creek is where we called that elk into Sarah a week ago or whatever it was. So I hiked up um, or my I, I parked way back here and this morning I hiked all the way up there and all the way up there and all the way up and around into there. So there you go. You can see how thick it is down there. It's a jungle. And if they're not calling, and they're not moving, they're not going to let you see them and videotape them. Alright. I'll be back later. Oh, Alright, here we go. Back in the barn. The beginning of this video was shot yesterday. It's really, really soggy outside and I'm still truckless and that is so frustrating I can't even describe it. Anyway, let's get right into it and get some voices heard. I'm sure I ranted enough yesterday in the woods. <clears throat> Excuse me, and wasted valuable time that could have been spent listening to people. Listen to this. This is titled, An Interesting Story from Oregon. Yeah, it might be awkward to read, maybe, because each, it's, everything's spaced out, <laughs> and it's not sentences, it's just really weirdly spaced, so, if I hiccup, I'm sorry, ahead of time. Steve, 
This is from the La D Flats area out of Estacada, Oregon. Around a year ago, June 21st, 2022, you shared a story from a gentleman who hunted this area and shared his stories of consistently running into Sasquatch. He spoke of accessing Bee Creek from Tumala Mountain, Squaw Mountain Road, north of Bedford Point. I heard this story and I found the area on onx.i. I realized that I have had experiences in this area as well. We used to camp slash party in the North Fork Pit, which was approximately 1.5 miles east of this area where these accounts occurred. Again, we used this pit along with a lot of Estacada residents to have fun and party. We traveled to this area around for around three years, 2012 to 2015, to have fun and let loose. My buddy Larry, who owns, sorry, my buddy Larry, who was among our group, had an encounter a couple years prior at Mirror Lake near Mount Hood, where he thought the experience he had at the time was BS until a tree fell across the trail. Background sound is the dog chewing on an elk bone. All right. Anyways, every time we were in this gravel pit, we would hear a loud scream from the back of the canyon around 8 p.m. Larry would always call back and laugh. The first two years, we never had anything significant happen as a result of the response, but the third year we were up there, it happened. We partied pretty late, blew up some Coleman fuel cells, shot guns, and drank alcohol. It was fun, and thankfully no one was hurt. That night, we all crammed in a summer tent and attempted to sleep. That must have smelled great, eh? Bunch of beer breath dirtbags in one tent. <laughs> Burping and farting. I woke up around 2 a.m. and moved to my rig to flip on the heat and get some sleep. There wasn't a ton of room in the tent. Well, the next morning, I touched base with Larry who was sleeping in the tent, and said that he was awakened around 2 a.m. by the sound of something slapping the tent. He also spoke some rocks being thrown that night. After the events of 2017-2018 in Hepner, that you've already read, times three, I'm confident that was a forest person doing weird stuff to our camp. I'm happy I made it to the rig, thinking back to this. Thank you for you do, Nick Marlowe. Okay, man, appreciate you and your time. People usually do chime in from the same zones of people that have shared their experiences, right? They usually chime in. Patterns and areas. Patterns, patterns. Like around my neighborhood. Oh yeah, alright, I guess I'll share this now. So, yesterday, once I got home, and I've been playing... I've been playing cat and mouse with this monster bear here for like three weeks straight, I think, when I'm home. Um, Sarah, she does her walk with Ruby, who protects her, overprotects her, it's really good. So she's doing walks with the dog. And I've been sharing with everybody what's going on around here for years. And uh, she said that yesterday she felt like someone was walking right behind her on her whole walk, or three quarters of the walk. And even Ruby kept looking behind her, and she kept looking behind her. She said she, she described it as, I could feel it right there, right behind me. I couldn't see nothing. I'm like, really? She's like, yes. She goes, it got to the point. She goes, I turned around. I said, leave me alone, out loud. And I'm like, no way. That's, that's a little odd, right? And then if we listen to everybody here, well, it's also a pattern that you can't ignore. You can't have X amount of confident people who have been running around, walking, living, playing, working in the same area for years, and then all of a sudden, one day, that person shares an experience like that, having something right beside them, right behind the tree, walking right parallel with them. Can't see anything. You can feel it. Can't see nothing. People that share that do not have a lifetime of that on average, right? So what I'm saying is, this is what I made note of, where, how often, what they've been doing, working, living, hiking, playing, whatever. And then all of a sudden, one day. Not every day. And all of a sudden, one day out of, a, out of hundreds, right? Anyway, moving along. Um, what do we got here? 
got here? Oh, wow. All right. Oh, this is interesting. Okay, here we go. I just fast forwarded to see how long it was and, and to see what photos were attached, which is a bunch. So here we go. Listen to this. Montana, forest, beast, story, and pictures of creature, question mark. August 8th, 23. Hello, Steve. My name is Eric Sudel. Thank you for reading this. I have a recent story and some pictures to share. I'd like to get your opinion on and share this event that happened to my two friends, Ryan and Corey and I, on a recent camping slash dirt bike dirt biking trip to the Montana backcountry. We were visiting the little Belt Mountains in Montana, north of White Sulphur Springs, Montana. We had been camping on the west side of that range, west of Highway 89. We had our camp near Moose Creek. Closer to the end of this trip, the last couple of days, I believe, August 8th, 2023, we decided to go for a longer ride on the bikes to Monument Peak Lookout Tower. It was about 35 miles to the lookout and another 35 miles back. So, getting back, we knew we would, keep, we would be getting pretty low on gas, but doable. We left camp, I want to say around 1 p.m. The ride to the lookout tower was awesome. We hung out at the lookout for 30 minutes or so. Then decided to take the Monument Ridge Trail to the Deep Creek Trail, which eventually dead ends, and you have to come back the same, that same way. We were riding our dirt bikes on the 50-inch trail, eventually along that Deep Creek section. The forest seemed to become more of an old-growth, pristine area. Almost a mystic vibe to the forest. Hard to explain, but I think you and most listeners will understand. Anyways, we were plugging along. At one point, we stopped in the mystic section just to catch a breather. We didn't, stay, we didn't stay for long, maybe three or four minutes. We knew we had to keep going because it was getting rather late in the day, and we knew we had a long ways back to camp. But all three of us felt a sense of uneasiness at that spot. We even talked about it why we were st we even talked about it why we were stopped. I think it meant while we were stopped. It was so quiet, I mean really quiet. No birds, no squirrels, no chipmunks, no sounds at all. You could hear a pin hit the forest floor. We jump back on the bikes and ride about 60 yards down the trail around a bend and we come to a log over the trail. Picture labeled one. Didn't think a whole lot about it. We slow down and carefully drive our bikes around the tree. We proceed on the trail for maybe another 150 yards or so getting pretty close to the end of the trail at that point, but the gas on Ryan's bike was getting low, and we decided to just turn around there. Ready to, get, ready to get back at the point, at that point, we zipped back up the direction we came. My friend Corey had a good lead on us, maybe 30, 40 seconds. I was riding second, and Ryan third, right behind me in viewing distance. Corey came back to the log laying across the trail. He made it around and stopped about 20 yards after the log right at the bend. Seen in picture labeled 2. While he's waiting, he spots a reddish, brownish, humanoid figure in the woods that appears to be staring at him in the close proximity of that downed tree. He takes a picture as he stands there. Maybe 30 seconds passed by passed by the time he stops to wait until we catch up. Corey loses time, it seems, from the conversations we've had about it. What he says is that he forgot he even took the photo. And when Ryan and I got to him at the tree, he just took off like nothing ever happened. He didn't feel any, he didn't feel any fear or mentioned it at the time. He just forgot the scenario ever happened. It wasn't until later that evening back at camp, going through pictures on his phone, he saw the photo and recalled the situation. Both Ryan and I recall feeling very anxious on the way back, passing that log. Not just because we had a long way to go and a short time to get there, but just a funny feeling that's hard to describe. Please feel free to share this story and share the pictures. I think the world needs to see this. I'd be very interested in your opinion on these photos. Again, thank you for reading this. Take care. Eric Sudel. All right. There is a... Okay, I'm, I'm looking at the pictures right now for the first time. I'll put them on the video. Zooming in. Wow. 
Definitely looks like flesh in a face, doesn't it? First pitcher. Now, come on. Second pitcher. That's quite the big trail, isn't it? That's a healthy tree, is it not? A little odd. I'm guessing that's a healthy log. A little bit of overexposure in the picture to really tell or distortion, but it looks like a healthy tree. And there's the face again. Odd. Very odd. Alright. There's all the... Yeah, that's just a weird photo. So, you're probably going to guess what I'm going to say, but I would suggest that you possibly um, uh, go back there if you can. And, you know, the, the usual, put somebody where that thing was. Try to pick the same time of day. Try to pick the same overcast light. You know what I mean? Get the same shadows, the same light. Not overcast. If it's a sunny day, go do it on a sunny day. If it's overcast, go do it on an overcast day. And uh, put somebody right where the photo was taken from. Put somebody where that image was. Take another photo. Right? So, but what do I have to say about the photos? Like, you know, what? everybody knows my stance on photos by now. It's like, whatever. They are what they are. There's nothing will ever come of a photo unless, I don't know, how could you? Unless it was like full hardcore, high quality, close up of like a chipped tooth, saliva, tongue, taste buds, an eye popped out from a bullet wound through the skull, whatever, right with brain matter coming out of the hole. Crystal clear picture of fine detail of everything that you would imagine. No, I'm not saying to shoot one in the head, I'm just saying. How else would you get that photo, <laughs> right? But anyway, so until then, they're just pictures, man. That's my opinion, they're just pictures. That's just me. There's a lot of people on here that are far more interested in the photos than me, and that's fine. Don't jump on my bandwagon, anybody ever, when it comes to photos. People ask me what I think, and I'm giving you an honest answer. It's just another picture coming from someone who's seen these frickin' beings. Thanks for sending that in, man. I absolutely appreciate you sending those in. But please, if you would, go back. Not too many people do it. Right? Not too many people do. We've had crazy videos sent in from people who promised they would put somebody up that river and do it again. They never did it. Had the guy from where was it? San Francisco or something? On the highway? Traffic stopped. Got a picture of that being up on the skylight over the hill standing over a car. Apparently he said his sister got a better photo. Said alright, send it in. Didn't send the photo the sister got and did not go back and take a photo of somebody standing with the image. Like, nobody does it. Why is that? Why is it that, well, no, we've had a few, for sure. But why is it the majority of the people that send in photographs do not, or videos do not send back a copy with someone standing in, in the place of where the, the image they were videoing or photographing and send it back to us? I don't know why. I haven't, I honestly haven't a clue why. But, on average, people don't do it. Oh well. It doesn't change anything, that's for certain. One thing for certain, it does not change a thing of what we see and what we know. Here is a book! Shall I go in? I'm going in. Here's a long one, here we go. Mark this is red. This is titled, A Lifetime of Knowing. Dear Steve, I may have accidentally sent this to you already this week. Someone reached out to me and said they had heard it on your channel. However, I didn't think I'd sent it, since I hadn't finished it yet. <laughs> well, a lot of stories obviously sound similar because it's truth is the main reason. If you've already read it, please let me know. I'm going to finish it and resend it now. I know you're a busy man, but would love to talk to you at some point. 
I think we are truly brothers from another mother, and I love your lifestyle. I hope this reaches you, as I am somewhat blind and technologically naive. This will probably take me a hundred times longer to write than it will for you to read. Okay, that sounds familiar. I have, rare disease, I have a rare disease, and I've had two cornea transplants, and I'm still having major eye troubles. I have to use 2.75 glasses and a magnifying glass to read or write a word. Please forgive any absent punctuation. This is a long one, so I guess I'll start at the beginning, but we'll try to keep it short as possible. Believe it or not, this is the first real email I've ever sent in my life. However, I must tell this story to someone besides close friends and family. You are truly a hero of the times, and I can't thank you enough for providing a safe place for us to share our amazing experiences. Okay, is there a... October 12th is when I think I saved this. Sounds similar. We had somebody said similar. Okay, I did a search in my notes, and this isn't in here previous, but why did I read some of, why does some of this sound familiar? I don't know. And there's a photo at the end of this I'm not familiar with either, so I'm going to read it. Odd moment. I'll start with a little background about me. I grew up hunting and fishing and wilderness survival. At six years old, my brother and I had our own trap lines. We'd trade our pelts for wooden nickels at Kohick's Trading Post in Salatisburg, Pennsylvania. Each wooden nickel was worth an ice cream cone. I spent a lot of time in the wilderness, including guiding for brown bear and Sitka black tail on Kodiak Island, Alaska for eight years, and now hunt the woods in Northern California. I come from a military family, somewhat, as my father was in the Army when I was born in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. My mom is a teacher, the daughter of Rear Admiral James R. Reedy commander of the whole 7th Fleet in the Navy. He was the first man to circumnavigate Antarctica and dove under the ice for National Geographic. He set up mail routes across the ice from South Africa to New Zealand and Australia. My brother is a former OED frogman in the Navy attached to SEAL teams. He's now a Pennsylvania State Trooper. I've read this part. Now, did we have, is this the email that started to go and then he forgot the ending maybe? We'll see. My father's brother, who passed away two weeks ago, was CIA. At my grandfather's memorial, my uncle told me that I beat to a different drum. I took it as a compliment. I'm what you would call the black sheep of the family. My name is Tate McIntosh. In 77, my parents separated, and my mother decided to move to Oregon in 79. A little ways after crossing into Oregon from Idaho, my mother woke me up by shaking me. My brother and my baby sister were asleep in the back seat of her old Subaru wagon. I woke to see a bright, Lava orange light coming through the windshield. My mother yelling at me. Do you see that? Do you see that? I looked up to see a craft above our car, probably 100 feet above us, almost directly but slightly under the edge of the disc-shaped disc craft. I could see the rim of the craft all the way around until it disappeared from the bright light emanating from the power source underneath it. I estimated it to be about 50 to 60 yards wide. It covered a four-lane highway with 30 yards between the east and west lanes. After watching the craft for three or four minutes, with my mother shaking me every 20 seconds to make sure I was seeing what she was seeing, the craft flew off straight down the highway. It felt so fast that the light particles were still hanging in our car momentarily. Then they dissipated in the direction of the car the craft left. Right after, four more flew past our windshield at incredible speeds. My mother, having grown up on a naval base all around the on naval bases all around the world, could identify all the conventional fighter planes and aircraft. My grandfather was one of National Geographic's top ten aviators in the history of flight since Kitty Hawk. Feel free to look him up. I digress. Fast forward three years. After the UFO sighting, my mother freaked out. She didn't know how to handle it and started talking to us and started taking us to church three times a week. I was told not to talk about the experience, as we were new to the area and she didn't want people to think we were crazy. So I swept it under the rug, for a while anyway. My mother met a man named Wally Unruh at church. Wally was 6'6", 260. A jolly fellow, part Native American. He was dark-skinned and always quite tan. Wally was also a hunter. He would take me fishing and hunting with him. Two things I really missed doing with my father, who still lived in Pennsylvania. 
Okay, we definitely read this, and I'm pretty certain this is the email that stopped shy of finishing. And we asked him to try to finish it. So we're going to keep going. That's what I'm saying. In 1981, Wally took me elk hunting in eastern Oregon. On our way to the hunting camp, we ran into a group of loggers standing in the road. None of them so much as turned around as we approached. They just kept staring at the mountainside. Okay, we did read this. Wally stopped the car and went to get out. The first word I heard as I opened the door was Bigfoot. As I got out of the car, I looked up on the hill that the loggers were looking at and saw a large black figure climbing the steep hillside. My eyes were good back then and I saw what it was. It was unmistakable to me. A large bipedal hairy man going up a 60 degree incline very fast. <clears throat> the 10 to 12 loggers that were watching it were second guessing what they were seeing. Bear maybe, but most were saying Sasquatch or Bigfoot. Wally Quick quickly grabbed his hunting rifle out of the back of his Toyota Celica and scoped the creature from the stability of the top of the car. After the creature reached the top of the rock face, it made for the tree line, which was across about 50 yards, a clear cut. After it disappeared into the trees, all the loggers turned to Wally and asked, well, what was it? Wally's tanned face came up off the scope and instantly turned ghost white. He mumbled that it wasn't a bear. I started to say it was a Bigfoot when he caught himself and said that he wasn't sure what it was. As we passed by the hillside that the creature was climbing, I noticed how incredibly steep it was and was amazed at how fast that it was ascended. After that, on the way to hunting camp, Wally told me not to talk about it, again with the silencing. I obeyed his order and did not mention it to the other hunters. The next morning I was up at four and ready to go and ready to get to a vantage point before first light. Wally procrastinated long enough to wait till first light to move. He was obviously scared shitless. His friends razzed him a bit about this 12-year-old kid who was rearing to go, and he's just procrastinating. The next morning I got him to move before first light, but upon reaching the mountaintop he made a fire. I told him, I told him that was not a good idea if we were elk hunting. He was still obviously very, very shaken from the previous day's experience and thought a fire would help keep us safe. The wind picked up and the fire caught a brush pile on fire. We spent the whole day trying to keep it from starting forest fire. In short, I've seen a UFO up close and seen a Sasquatch with my own eyes at very young age. I've had no choice but to think along certain lines of thought since having these experiences. Most people go from believing to knowing and then to the hardest part, understanding. I've been in the understanding part for a long time now and have had more experiences since this, since this happened. I don't want to take up all your time, but I feel I must tell these stories because I'm not sure how much longer I'll be able to see. Also, it is them that brought you to me. What? The forest people kept bringing your YouTube videos up on my phone? I swiped it off many times thinking it was another hunting video, but it kept reappearing. At the time, I was in the woods in Northern California, an hour north of Nevada City. I was staying at a friend's property, a pristine micro-environment in the mountains of the Tahoe National Forest. This is no cell service where his property is, so I would have to drive at least a mile and a half to get cell service. Every time I did, your site would show up on my phone. I had several experiences between my first and now, but I will only tell of my latest experiences. Thanks for bearing with me and listening, Steve. Much appreciated. Here it goes. Okay, that sounds odd. Mm. Upon driving at my friend's property, I could feel an energy that I couldn't explain. Very raw and pure. See, none of this is familiar now, this part of the story. The very first night I spent in my friend's mother-in-law's camper trailer. In the late evening, I heard sticks hitting the top of the camper. I opened the door and looked up. I was not under a tree or near one, and the wind was not blowing. I just wondered. That's strange. The second night, I was sitting in the trailer at the table with my dog, Angus. Angus was on the opposite side of the table on his bed on the seat. He's a pretty, pretty big dog at 108 pounds. Half black lab, half German short hair. The perfect hunting dog. Okay, that sounds familiar. He had spent his whole life with me in the woods, and I could always tell what was outside or, or in the area by the way he barked. I could tell it was deer, coyote, lion, or bear. 
As we sat there, he started growling in a low, something's out there growl. Okay, I read that part. I asked him what was out there, and he started to get up and slowly walk towards the door, still growling. I opened the door and said, go get him. He would usually bolt out the door and start barking at whatever was out there. Instead, he just got to the door, growled a little, and then backed up and went back to his bed, still growling. All the while, the look on his face said it all. There was something out there that he did not want to contend with. I'd never seen him act scared or anything before. Act scared of anything before. The next night, they came back, and though it seemed so surreal, like a dream, told me telepathically that they know that I was coming when the trees fell. My friend had just dropped several trees to get more sunlight in his garden the day before I arrived. Hmm? My sister knew that I'm a Sasquatch enthusiast and had sent me a little two-dimensional wax figurine of a Sasquatch. I put it on top of the light fixture outside the front door of the camper. When I looked, or when I looked again, it was gone. I looked all around, thinking it had fallen off, or I put it somewhere else. I also noticed that all, the, all of Angus's toys were gone as well. His stuffed animals and his squeaky ball. He was very bummed he had no toys, and we were very far from anywhere I could replace them easily. I started on offering, I started an offering plot, about 10 foot by 10 foot, clearing away all debris and raking the plots so that anything that stepped on it would leave a print. I put a bowl of apples in the middle of it, and they would come and take the apples, not leaving any sign. There were no other markings on the freshly raked dirt, no birds, no deer, no bear, but the apples were gone. I then went up to the garden at night without a flashlight, hoping to have an encounter. I asked them, I asked them to bring back my figurine and my dog's toys. On the way back to my trailer, I stepped wrong in the shadow of the moonlight and seriously hurt my ankle. This really bummed me out because I was planning to go back up to Truckee, California to go dancing with friends the next night. As I went into the trailer, I asked if they could bring back Angus's toys, my figurine, and if possible, please heal my leg. The next morning, I got up to get out of bed and gingerly went to put my foot down. Upon putting my weight on it, I discovered that there was no pain. Putting more weight on it, I discovered that it did not hurt at all and was fully healed overnight. What? Amazing. The next day, I went up to the house to do my dishes. I used the same trail to go up to the house. I had already done the trip a couple times that day. Upon exiting the house and walking back down the trail to the camper, I saw two of Angus's stuffed toys at the top of the trail where it meets the driveway. They were not there when I had to come up the hill previously. One was a stuffed bunny rabbit and the other was a stuffed raccoon. Each toy had a certain kind of stuffing. Both had small tears in it from Angus chewing on them. Oh, small tears in it from Angus chewing on them. After getting in the camper, I went to put the dishes away and opened the utensil drawer to put away silverware. In the utensil drawer, there was the stuffing from Angus's toy raccoon. He was not there when I made breakfast that morning. Again, there is no one on the property and the gate was locked. Later that afternoon, I got ready to go to Truckee and loaded my truck as it started to rain. After loading Angus up, I decided to take a last look at the offering plot to see if any apples were gone. They were gone. As I started to pull out past the camper, I saw the pink Sasquatch figurine on the propane tanks. Not where I left it. It was not there before. I got out and examined it. The plastic wrappings was off and one of the legs was broken off. I knew they had been there and maybe still were. Pulling out of the property, I opened the gate and drove through it. As I looked up, I saw a large bush move like something very big was standing there and took off. I jumped out of my truck to look around. Again, no wind, no nothing there. A big storm was coming in and I went back to Truckee for a, for a few days. Upon returning to the property, there was a few feet of snow on the ground. The power was out. The ground was covered with snow and mud. Walking in on one of my tire tracks to avoid walking through the deep snow, I got a shock that went up the back of my leg like I stepped on a hot wire. It's enough to make me stop and say, what the F was that? I looked back through my last two or three steps and found a rock underneath my footprint. I picked it up, looked at it, cleaned it off, and thought, how oh, this rock gave me such a shock. 
After cleaning it off and looking at it, there were several distinct faces on it, including the shape of the rock itself. I took it back to my trailer and cleaned it off some more. All in all, I have found at least 12 Sasquatch faces on this stone. It always seems to be warm, or at least have some sort of energy to it. I try, I'll try to include a picture if I could find one. These people love to play head games with you. Not sure if it is an adolescent messing with me, but there are several different ways they do it. The area in front of the garage building was a big muddy puddle. I had to walk on a snow bank that had formed underneath the edge of the roof where half of the snow had broken off to make a bank to walk around the puddle. I was careful when walking it, for the rest of the roof had not slid yet. I found out the next precipice in which I get reception to make some calls. Sorry, I went out to the, the pre precipice in which I get reception to make some calls. Upon return, I noticed that the rest of the roof had slid in my absence. Curiously, there was a handle of a shovel sticking out of the top of the freshly piled snow that had just slid. I'd broken that shovel handle a few weeks before, and there's no way it could have popped up and landed perfectly upright in the fresh stuff. It had been against the wall underneath some pieces of corrugated roofing, which was that was laying against the building. Hmm. After pondering for a moment as to how this could have happened, I started to make my way to the trailer. I found some PUD trucks. Power, power line workers go by and said, thank God, maybe now I can get a shower. I opened the door to my trailer where on the bench seat of the table was a towel. A towel laid folded on the seat where I sit. It wasn't mine, and I had no idea how it got there. On my next trip out to the press precipice to make calls my friend to make calls my friend and asked if he or his wife had come down to the property and left a towel on my seat. Neither had been there and were still up at Lake Tahoe. The next day the power came back on. I was finally able to take a shower. But how'd they know? How do you know it was they? There are many other things that happened in this time period, but I won't go into the any, I won't go into all of the details, but there were things like them turning my music on and off after I turned it off a few times. They liked the Native American flute music I was playing and would not rest until I played it for them on a speaker. After my friend's mother took her trailer back, I put my ten-man tent down by the trailhead leading up to where they reside. They did not like this. I came back to find that something had put its hand on the top of my tent where my tent poles cross and push down, breaking all my tent poles. I'm going to stop now, but we'll send you more experiences when I can. Thanks for again for sharing this. It took me a week or so to write. Much love to you and your family, Tate McIntosh. All right, and then you shared a photo, but no description of where the photo came from or whose it is or whatever. And it's of... Uh, it looks like some kind of depiction of some cowboys having a gunfight with a couple upright hairy gorilla type looking beings. There you go, share it. Now, that was a long one and it was confusing for me because I read most of it but I did read the last half, so. Alright. Quite the family history, that's for sure. You've seen some shit. It's amazing, and I'm not being a dick when I say this, but when uh, when odd things happen around people's homes or wherever, a lot of people just go straight to, well, it's obviously Sasquatch, or obviously Sasquatch put that on my phone, or Sasquatch put the towel on my truck. You know, um, I can't, I cannot tell anybody what did or who did what. I can't. I'm not that guy. Obviously, nobody is. But my mind will innocently and how do you say this because it doesn't matter it seems it doesn't matter what you say online somebody's gonna blow a gasket because of what you said so it's almost like you go you have to go on potato chips or eggshells sometimes right when you're trying to be as neutral and kind and polite as possible by saying well you didn't see one of these beings put a towel in your truck so how do you know it was one of these beings you didn't see them footprints or handprints or anything, they put the shovel handle on the roof in the snow. So how does your mind say instantly, though it's definitely a Sasquatch, saw by people that did it. 
right? It's like my knife. And it's amazing how many people, not many, but a handful of people who are emotion I call them emotionally challenged because they automatically think that I'm angry that a knife appeared in my backpack seven months later and eight miles away from where I lost it. And they think I'm angry when I haven't shown any anger at all. And it's another example of me having to go on eggshells, tiptoe, at how I deliver to the public because there's always going to be a handful of people that just are too emotionally bent and lash out for some unknown effing reason, right? So I'll use my knife experience as an example. And no, there isn't a hint of anger in me when it comes to this experience. I lost that knife, custom hand-built knife that was generously given to me from this watcher on this channel. Lost it, 110% lost it on the road, in the snow. No, I lost it on bare ground while elk hunting. No, it wasn't, it was in the snow. Sorry, I'm just going back because I've been to this place so many times throughout one year. I lost it deer hunting in the snow. That's why I had to go back and look for it. My other friends came up after I'd already been hunting a week or so. They came up, they had a side by side. My friend's daughter and her other friend met up with us at an intersection of an old par thin power line and dirt road all covered in snow and tracked right up. They had found, said we found a trail camera back there on the tra on the road. No way, it's one of mine. Oh, that explains it. So I wonder what else I lost besides my knife. Because at first I thought I just lost the knife. I always have so many trail cameras in my backpack and I never count them. I'm always, I got them in my pack box. I got them here, I got them there, I got them in the truck. So I don't keep count and intimate tabs on how many trail cameras I have at the time. But they had one of my trail cameras. I'm like, oh shit, where'd you find it? Way back there on the intersection. I'm like, oh no, I lost a knife too. So that told me, because when I take my backpack off, I strap it on the back of my quad, which is the rope. So I guess I must have unzipped the back opening. Shit fell out as I quadded along, and it was in the snow. So imagine trying to go look for a knife that has fallen in the snow and been tracked on for how many days. That's when I lost the knife. Yeah, I did go down that road looking, but I mean, where would you even begin to look? Who knows how long the might. I rattled down that road as the stuff randomly fell out of my backpack, right? So. Um, and I shredded my backpack looking for that knife, which wasn't hard to do. It's a single container backpack, put stuff on the bottom, there's a zipper compartment in the lid, undo the, the half moon zipper in the bottom to access in the bottom. Stuff can't hide. Now, seven months later, eight-ish miles away, I've, been use, I've used that backpack, I'm going to retell the story, I've used the backpack how many times? And uh, I stopped at an elk lick walla where I had some trail cameras and I was looking with the SD card reader in my phone. I put my backpack in the middle of the trail on the cut line road right there. There's clover and grass that long. Not, there's no, it's not thick timber, it's wide open. Logged off area over there, logged off above me, patch of spruce about 20 by 20 foot right beside me. I went walking up the cut line trail that way for about 80 yards, left my ship behind me on the middle of the cut trail right behind me. Still no cover, full view of me right behind me. I go back, I unzip my backpack, has my friend come up with a quad. There's that knife laying on top of all of my stuff, plain view without a sheath. All right, that's the story. Now, the part about the anger part. People say, people have, it almost, it's hard to get your delivery with text smooth, first off, right? Text sucks, typing sucks. Especially when you look at the comment section on any video. People say something, another person says something, and, and it just goes into ferocious attack. It's amazing and sad to watch and witness daily. If you go there on comment sections on various anything. It's so bizarre how people trigger so fast, and meanwhile, you don't even know the demeanor or the delivery tone of somebody typing. It's impossible. But everybody goes to automatic. It's angry. It's mean. They're lashing. i got to get back at them. Right? Anyway, I'm babbling. I have not had any anger when it comes to this knife experience, but what the frustrating part for my brain is, people say, just say thank you. Quit being so angry about it. Just say thank you. And I've had that reaction out how many times. I'm like, take it easy, Skippy. I'm not angry. I'm not lashing out. And I'm not that simple. You cannot place a knife in my backpack 
from eight miles away and have me go, <laughs> thank you, and then I carry on like it didn't happen. That would make me pretty dim between the ears. Would it not? Think about it. So, me, I want to know how. Who and how. Just because I lost a knife, <clears throat> excuse me, seven months earlier, in the snow, eight miles away, and all of a sudden that knife shows up in my backpack, in my face, halfway through a frickin' hunting trip, but I've used the backpack every single day, accessing it every morning and every evening, my brain doesn't go, oh, this is Sasquatch people, thanks Sasquatch people, thanks Sabe people, and then I carry on like it didn't happen, and it just doesn't work that way between my ears. I apologize in advance if it's making you rage and lash out at my reaction to a knife showing up in my backpack. Boom. No, my brain goes, what the F? What? <laughs> no, no. How did that happen? How did that happen? I can't automatically say who did it. And there's a kind gesture. Obviously there's a kind gesture, but it's also one hell of a mind fuck. Sorry about the language, but it is. That's a mind fuck if your brain thinks for itself and wants to know what's up and thinks rationally. It's easy. It's easy to pass that off as one of these beings, isn't it? Right? Then you just carry on with the day. Well, answers, answers provided. There you go. And carry on. Not me. Not me. I know people that, my old girlfriend years ago had that antique camera <laughs> placed right on that trail behind her home, rural, middle of nowhere home, where you cannot access that side of her property from the main road. You can't. And then from there on, it's just mountains straight back to the Duffy Lake Highway, which is miles away over the top. Boom. She does her daily hike up that, that trail. And then one day, bam, there's an antique camera sitting right there in her face on the trail basically meant for her to see and pick up and she automatically said that's the Sasquatch you see she is the same girl had the Sasquatch loping beside the car looking in the car at them in the snow blizzard same girl or the Rottweiler who bit like seven or eight different people as an example aggressive it is and uh, something slapping the shit out of her house on the second floor up where her bedroom was and the dog is crawling under the bed whimpering terrified this huge kick-ass attack Rottweiler right so I understand why she automatically assumes that these people left her the camera. I get it. I'd probably think the exact same thing. But until somebody says, hey dude, I did it. Introduces himself and says, I did it. I put your knife in the backpack. I don't know. Is it one of these people? I don't know. Is it a spirit from my past in my, one of my friends or family members who's died? Did they do it? I don't know. Maybe. Or is there something going on with maybe possibly a skill that we used to have generations ago and all of a sudden the stars and the planets lined up the right way, my vibration was right on point and the thought of that knife and possibly there's some missing skill we have kicked into gear, boom, found it, put it in my backpack. Maybe, <laughs> right? Maybe. Now, I don't know, but that's how my brain works when it comes to these details and details that people share with us. I just can't jump on the, everything was done by a 9 to 12 foot tall, 5 to 8 thousand pound being did it. You can't convince me of it. I can't jump on that wagon, bandwagon. I just can't without the proof, right, of them doing that. And then people are going to say, well, how come you don't need more proof because they exist? Well, I've seen these hairy beings in the forest. I've seen them. I've heard them numerous times. It's not a question. I've seen the proof that they exist. Have I seen the proof that they can take a knife that I lost eight miles or seven months previous put in my backpack? Having a frickin' clue. Right? That's a bit of a rant. <laughs> there you go. So... Quit lashing out at me for my curious my curious mind. It's not it's not the it's not the right thing to do to tell somebody to stop thinking and wondering, and wanting answers. Just accept it happened and smile in the sky and say thank you and carry on. <laughs> Quit being stupid. That does not provide answers. 
All right? It doesn't. I want to know. Especially I want to know if... I want to know. I just want to know the answers to everything, including if we have skills to do some crazy shit. All right, now, carrying on. I'm getting some text from friends. Sorry for that interruption and the bit of a rant, but I hope that stops people from just lashing out and assuming emotions when they are not correct when it comes to people online. Right? All right, let's get one more shared here, and then I am going to go put on my rain gear and get some shit done around here. What is it, Sunday? I think. Where are we? Must be Sunday. Sunday! Oh man, I hope I get a truck back tomorrow. Listen to this. Mark, this is red. This is titled, It Grabbed and Pulled Me. And the first paragraph is just for me, and I just read it before I hit record. And all I can say to that paragraph is, dude, holy shit. I guess it's time for my experiences below can be shared. I grew up in western New York, Rochester, not too far from the Canadian border. My dad built a mini mansion that backed up to the Forever Wild Woods. That's the New York program that keeps them as is. Once the house was built, the woods became the playhouse for myself and closest friend, DJ. It was the early 90s and we loved being outside. One day while exploring, we found an amazing section about 50 minutes walk into the woods, it was a gorgeous swamp full of flowers and life. I remember approaching it there, and I, I remember approaching it. There were snapped trees all around and straight branches jammed into the ground like spikes. The solid land went into the swamp like a peninsula. The trees were almost like walls on each side that funneled us out onto it. We approached the water and saw snapping turtles quickly submerge. Being kids, we started skipping rocks and throwing boulders to get splashes. Just doing what kids do. Then out of nowhere, DJ and I felt a wave of fear. The kind of fear that is left from our caveman days. Sort of a sixth sense. Our hair stood up. We were both looking around for what triggered this primal feeling. DJ pointed to a tree across the water, and I can only describe it as if the top half was bending back and forth. Not like the wind was gently pushing it, but like it was close to snapping. Left then right, back then forth, it was bending, creaking loud, over and over, quicker and quicker. The bottom of the tree barely moved. Then out of nowhere, there was this rumbling growl that was so loud it shook our insides. I've been, around, I've been around loud things before and even learned to shoot an 8-gauge black powder shotgun. No sound compared to the force of this. Picture your soul getting pushed out your back and then springing back inside like a giant invisible rubber rubber band. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been surprised if the hair on my head was blown back. DJ even pissed his pants. In the pure, in the pure silence of this, we both ran for our effing lives the whole way home. We ran through bushes and branches, ripping up our exposed skin. We both thought we could hear pursuit all around us, but said nothing. Once home, we tried sharing what happened with my parents, but they wouldn't listen. We decided to stay inside the rest of the day. As usual, DJ was spending the night, and we decided to crash in the sun porch. Picture a 25 by 25 foot room filled with double hung windows on two exterior walls, a slide glass door that led to a three story deck, and a French door that led to a formal living room. Dad worked hard, went from a garbage man to a business owner, so this house was massive, man. Anyway, DJ was on the couch while I laid on the floor in front of the TV with a Nintendo. It was summer, so all the double hung windows were open wide. I stretched out with my arms behind my head my neck on a couple of pillows, and fingers were interlaced. My hands were sort of folding up the back of my head with elbows flared out. DJ was out and snoring, and I was half asleep watching something on the TV. Steve is God is my, is my witness, man. Out of nowhere, I felt a massive hand engulf both my hands and part of my wrist and pull me towards the windows. I moved a good two to three feet and effing lost it. 
screaming in terror. It released me, and within a minute, my dad ran in. DJ was silent and just staring at me. I told my dad what happened, so he went to each window and said the screens were all slid down and in place. It was just a dream for me to man up and shut up. Dad's a severe alcoholic drug addict from my childhood. Oh, that's sad to hear. I shut up, afraid he'd just go, he'd just go back out. I looked at DJ and asked him if he saw it. He just looked at me and didn't say anything about it. He ended up calling his parents and getting picked up in the middle of the night. I went upstairs and tried to sleep in my room. The next day I called over to DJ's house to see if he wanted to come over, and his mom said he doesn't feel good. To not call again until I hear from him. This confused my 12-year-old mind. We never got together again after that. I'd see him occasionally, and he was cold with me every time. Eventually, at the end of summer, I ran into him on the canal path, one of our fishing spots, and decided to question him. His mom wasn't there to be the buffer. He finally confessed that on that night, for some reason, he awoke and saw a, quote, predator, end quote, grab and pull me. He didn't use that specific word. Instead, he described a massive, clear, but with distorted shimmer thing, reached in and grabbed me. Until I found your channel, I never knew others had seen this cloak of in invisibility. I now refer to it as a predator. Did it lift the screen up? They slide easily enough, and then close it that quick? Did it somehow pass through the fiberglass mesh? I just don't know. I looked in the morning but saw no tracks, and DJ thought it was a ghost. I didn't put it all together until much later. As an adult, I think it followed me home after we trespassed on its turf. It could have hurt us easily at any time, but it didn't. I almost think it had a sick type of humor and enjoyed terrifying us a little bit. I never went that far back in the woods after that. I was too scared to. That experience did give me a desire to learn about the paranormal world, and I'm fascinated by it. I do feel some relief sharing this. I kept this to myself for 30 years. Not too long after that summer, Dad's addictions caught up and he lost the house and main business. He had major tax problems. The kind where prison is involved. We moved to a small rental house about 45 minutes away. He stayed out of prison for that situation, but lost everything, including his worth ethic and his drive. He ended up doing some prison time over another similar white-collar crime years later. At 15, I left and had a rough time. You know the saying, quote, you are your father's son, end quote. That's just like him, the good and the bad. I can celebrate 13 years being clean now. It's sad that my parents now live in a tiny one-bedroom subsidized apartment. His health is horrible. He even had to have his leg amputated. Years of addiction have caught up with his body. I'd love to say he's clean and sober, but that's not the case. On one hand, I understand about self-medicating and that if he quit tomorrow, it would extend his little bit of time he has left. It, sorry. If he quit tomorrow, it wouldn't extend his little bit of time he has left. I had to forgive and move on in order to break the cycle with myself and my family. Life's hard and uncertain. Thank you, Steve, for what you do. Please understand how much you positively affect some of us. Even Sawyer watches your intro with me. If you actually got through all this, I have to spend the time and share other experience. Deep in the coal mining area of Pennsylvania and seeing a giant beast with the head of a black German shepherd on two frickin' buff legs. I have to force myself to stop with this email with Dublin size. Thanks, man, you're a fan. Big L. If I hit one of these Powerball lottos, I'll retain your guide services. <laughs> I was, going to I was going to attach some Google Earth pics of where it happened, but I didn't know if your email would allow it. End of email. Wow. First off, man, I wish you absolute frickin' luck with all the shit going on at home right now. That's amazing. What a challenge. What a task. And what a shitty experience. Now, why, why, why do so many of these bizarre beings that outclass us in so many ways why do they take the time out of their time to go terrorize any simple, innocent, harmless human being is beyond me. I don't get it. I don't get a lot, but I don't get that part. Why? Why not go 
Go to the Middle East, <laughs> right? Go terrorize people that are killing each other. Go to go 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 to go to a war torn area and go attack the politicians that are creating this war and all the grief. Go attack all those people. You know what I mean? Why not go attack the the true evil doers in this world? Leave the innocent alone. If you're that skilled, if you're that skilled and untouchable and unacknowledged. Then you want to terrorize a human being. Go go make it worth your while, man. Go get the pricks that, that need it. Not these innocent people that get scarred for life because of it. It doesn't make sense to me. That part frustrates me. But anyway, yeah. Um, emails back with the German, German shepherd-headed thing. Why? Because someone we know has DNA from something with that description. And is going to let us know what the F that is all about. And uh, furthermore, it's a topic, it's an item that can't be ignored because tens of thousands of people have seen something with that similar description, right? So make sure you email us back with that experience for sure. Pennsylvania, man, it's on fire with the weirdest shit is in that state. So common. Geographically, I wonder why, right? But then again, this shit's going on all around, all around the planet, right? Anyway, I'm going to get going. It's funny, yesterday I still can't shake that feeling that I had yesterday morning getting out. I had Sarah's car, Tahoe, yesterday and I was in the dark up that road. And I, the second I parked, because I like to go up this road, up this valley, between two steep, thick timbered hills. And there's a creek down the bottom, big timber. And I know the elk go up that creek sometimes. And I want to go up there in the dark and let out that bugle. Yesterday morning in the dark, first, see if I got a response, and, and then I could slowly start locating where they were, and I got nothing. But the second I pulled over, I felt anxious and felt kind of, uh, and I was remember going like this in the car. Don't know why. You guys know how often I go in the woods. It's daily. And then I got out of the car, and I left the door open. <laughs> right? And then it didn't feel right. It felt real. I felt very insecure. But then I went all the way down to the bottom of the valley, hooked to the left in the other valley, and did my hike all up the mountain, not a problem. Not weird. Just on the other side of the valley. But then I heard those two. I thought I heard one, now I know I did. And then I heard definitely 100% heard the second bong ringing through the valley somewhere right around me. Not right close to me, but nearby. Yeah, I can't shake that one yet. Still, it's, in the, it's fresh. Like I can still feel that feeling. It's not a good feeling. I don't, not for my personality type or whatever, how I'm built. I don't like that feeling of feeling uneasy. It bothers me. Anyway, enough babbling. On the day. Share my story at howtohunt.com. All right? Get the knowledge out there. Get it out there. Help people help themselves. Help people become more aware and help people learn more truth before it's this, ru this runs over, right? The more people learn truth, ups their chances of shit changing in the better for the people, right? That's why we're here.